Hi, this is Pastor Darrell Myatt from Keller, Texas. Today is Thursday, April 12, 2018. This channel is all about world news, Bible prophecy, end time events, and the return of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You heard about this gas attack in Syria. It seems like most of the world is blaming Bashar al-Assad, the president of Syria. Syria is denying it. Uh, Russia is saying it wasn't Assad. Seems like a lot of things are happening in regards to this. I'm reading where experts are saying this will lead to World War III. Who knows? Uh, maybe it will, maybe it won't. Out of Haaretz, Russian military police helped Bashar Assad take control of town hit by chemical attack. So Bashar Assad and his military police are taking control of Duma, uh, if that's how you pronounce it, close to Damascus. Syrian government forces have taken full control over this town. This is the last rebel stronghold outside of Damascus. Russian news agencies reported today. The raised state flag over a building in the town of Duma has heralded the control over this location and therefore over the whole of eastern Ghouta. So, Bashar al-Assad's forces have taken over the town. Don't know what may come next. Don't know what's going to happen next. I'm just like you, watching and waiting and praying and hoping. Uh, so many people saying, yeah, World War III is coming. Out of the Times of Israel, photos show Russian Navy has left Syria port ahead of possible U.S. strike. Russia has moved almost all of its warships out of the port of Tartus in Syria, ahead of a potential strike on the country by the United States. Does Russia know something that we don't? Did America call them and go, hey, you know what? Guess what? Uh, yeah, we're about to bomb Syria. You might want to get your boats out of there. I mean, Trump tweeted, hey, Russia, yeah, the, the missiles are coming. I mean, is that a warning? Is that, uh, I don't know if Trump called Vladimir Putin. Who knows? Seems like Russia thinks something's about to happen, so they're getting their ships out of the port in Syria. Out of Haaretz, Russia takes a jab at Trump over Syria, saying, uh, by the way, we don't do Twitter diplomacy. You know, Donald Trump, we all know he likes to use Twitter. The Kremlin said it does not engage in Twitter diplomacy after U.S. President Donald Trump used the social media platform to warn Russia of imminent military action in Syria, saying the missiles are coming. Russia's like, oh yeah, we, we don't do Twitter diplomacy. You know, there's, there's a right way and a wrong way to um, let us know things, and Twitter may be not the right way. Uh, <clears throat> moving on to Israel. So much going on with Israel. Out of the Jerusalem Post, Mahmoud Abbas says Palestinians won't accept any American peace plan. Huh, imagine that. Could it be that their goal is not peace after all? Yeah, a lot of us can see right through their phony front they put up. They're not at all interested in peace. They're only interested in destroying Israel. They're only interested in making all of the land of Israel into all of the land of Palestine. Saying, I don't care what Trump comes up with. We won't abide by it. We're not going to do it. We, you know, if they start with a two-state solution and give us East Jerusalem as a shared capital, as our capital, then we might be able to talk. But other than that, yeah, probably not. Fine. Okay, Mr. Mahmoud Abbas, keep doing what you're doing and expecting different results. You know, that's pretty much the definition of crazy. Doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. Yeah, probably not going to happen. Um, so yeah, just sit back and hope that something will change and hope that Israel will completely disappear and go away and then you might take over what God had given to them. But that's not going to happen. Out of the Times of Israel, White House demands Hamas relinquish control of Gaza. White House is saying to Hamas, hey, yeah, you need to give up Gaza, you need to turn it over to Fatah, you need to disarm and put down your weapons. 
Yeah, probably not going to happen either. Um, did you see this this guy? Uh, Hamas's Gaza leader, Yahya, is that his name? Yahya Sinwar, who helped orchestrate and encourage the demonstrations billed as the March of Return. He was saying that Sinwar gave a speech where he asserted Palestinians would tear down the wall and tear out the Israelis' hearts. It would tear out their hearts. Well, that's a pretty monstrous message, don't you think? What kind of leader does this? What kind of leader says, yeah, we're going to go rip their hearts out. We're going to tear down their wall and rip out their hearts. And the world wants them to give up control and lay down their arms. You think that's going to happen? Yeah, not likely. Not without force. Out of the Times of Israel, Israel solemnly remembers 6 million victims on Holocaust Remembrance Day. Nationwide sirens sounded at 10 a.m., kicking off ceremonies throughout the country. President Rivlin leads March of the Living at Auschwitz. Israel came to a standstill at 10 o'clock. Today, this morning, as sirens wailed throughout the country in memory of the 6 million Jews murdered by the Nazis during World War II, buses and cars would stop on the streets and highways. They would step out of their vehicles, and they would bow their head and stand there silently for two minutes. Everybody, every road, every crowd, every car, they stop, and they remember the six million killed in the Holocaust. Many Muslims denying that this even happened. Amazing. Never again. Out of JTA, JTA out of Jerusalem, at Holocaust Remembrance Day ceremony in Israel, Netanyahu warns Iran not to test his country's determination. He said, do not test the determination of the state of Israel, warning Iran, saying Israel is not your enemy but the regime of tyranny that oppresses you is. Remembering those killed. Now the Jerusalem Post, Israeli minister says, Russia takes us seriously. It has no interest in opposing us. Russia and Israel are not enemies. Today we have the best cooperation with Russia since the establishment of the state, so the Russians have no interest in opposing us, said housing minister Yoav Gallant. Russia has no interest in opposing you. Maybe Russia has an interest in coming after all that oil and natural gas that you've recently discovered. Just saying. If you've been on Facebook in the last day or two, well, of course, you've been seeing all this stuff about Mark Zuckerberg and his testimony testifying in front of the uh, Congress uh, Joint Committee, whatever it is. Um, amazing kind of the information that they're selling about us, isn't it? He's making a lot of money selling our information. There's a lot of people saying, well, would you pay a monthly uh, subscription to be on Facebook? Well, you know, the only reason I'm on there is because it's free. If I had to pay for it, yeah, no, I, I can't take on another monthly debt. I don't care how small it would be. <laughs> um, but if you've been on Facebook in the last few days, you've probably also seen these people saying, oh, the rapture is coming April 23rd. All Christians are going to disappear. And I'm just like, really? Really, guys? You're going to set a date once again so the unbelieving world can once again call us Christians crazy, setting dates when Christ is going to return. Let me just say... Not going to happen. I'm pretty certain April 23rd is not going to be the rapture. So I, for one, will not be selling all my stuff and giving everything away and, and standing outside on a hilltop in a white robe waiting for the rapture. Um, here's a story. Conspiracy theorists claim end of world is coming April 23rd when Nibiru appears, this planet X. 
I'm so tired of hearing these conspiracy things. Um, they're saying on April 23rd, the sun, the moon, and Jupiter will align with constellation Virgo to bring on the start of the biblical rapture, according to the latest claims. Planet Nibiru, Nibiru will appear in the sky, followed by the onset of World War III, the rise of the Antichrist, and seven years of tribulation. People, don't fall for this kind of deception. NASA has insisted this so-called death planet doesn't even exist. So many people over the last few months and years have said, oh, this is going to be the date, and it came and went. Nothing happened. I'm pretty sure that it won't be happening on April 23rd either. I mean, I'll watch and pray, but I would never be so foolish as to set a date and say, this is going to happen on this day. Because pretty much if you say it will, you can almost guarantee it won't. Just saying. Let's get into the Word. In Luke 17, Luke 17, verse 10, it says, and this is Jesus talking, he says, so, like, so likewise you, when you have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. We're unprofitable servants. We did what was our duty. We're here to serve. That's what we're supposed to do. When I was a kid, you would see this, this uh, bumper sticker that says, God is my co-pilot. And I used to think, well, you're sitting in the wrong seat. You should be God's co-pilot. But if you think about it, I don't think God even wants us to be in the cockpit there. You know, some people think of God as their co-pilot or, or their they're a close buddy, and they have casual conversations with them. Now, yes, it is true that God wants to be our friend, but he wants so much more than that. I mean, he is the master creator. He is the divine authority. He is the potter. We are the clay. He's the shepherd. We're the sheep. He's the master, and we're the servant. When you read in 1 Corinthians, um, 1 Corinthians 6, starting in verse 19, what? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? You were bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You belong to God. You're not your own. You were bought at a price. It was a very high price. It was the blood of Jesus that purchased you. We always need to remember that everything belongs to God. Our lives belong to God. Our family, our possessions, our future belongs to God. It all belongs to God. It's all His. You know, our mission in life is not to find out how God can bless our goals and our dreams and ambitions. Our objective should be to find out what God's will for our life is and then submit to it. Huh. We need to serve. We are a disciple of Jesus Christ. We're here to serve. We're not here to be served. We have a mighty advocate praying on our behalf. In John 17, verse 9, this is Jesus talking. And he says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. Jesus, praying for you. What would you think if I told you Jesus is in the next room praying for you? Would that give you a sense of comfort, a sense of peace, joy, confidence, strength? Well, think about it. I mean, because distance doesn't really matter with an omniscient God, with an omnipotent God, a God who's everywhere at all times, who knows everything. Whether Jesus is in the very next room or at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, he's praying for you. 
He is your advocate. He is one that's praying on your behalf. He's praying for us. I mean, Jesus even told Simon Peter this. You know, Simon Peter seems to be like kind of a man's man. Um, he, he's, he's one of the guys in the Bible I can probably most closely relate to because I try to do things in my own strength sometimes. And, you know, there are times I have probably in my life been arrogant or, or proud or even boastful of the things I could do. Now, it's one thing when you're an athlete and you're competing and maybe talking a little trash or trying to uh, intimidate your opponent, but it's another thing when it's regular everyday life and you're bragging or boasting about something. Simon Peter was something of a, a, a tough guy. He seemed to be proud of it. He'd boast in his own strength, <clears throat> but Jesus told him, Simon, Satan has demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail in Luke 22 verses uh, 31 and thereabouts. <clears throat> so even though Simon Peter denied Jesus three times, his faith didn't fail. I mean, he did find love and mercy and restoration in Christ Jesus. He became one of the leaders of the early church. This was because Jesus prayed for him. I think it's very comforting to know that if Satan is out to get you, Jesus is praying for you. He's your advocate. He is praying for you. We can be confident in that. <clears throat> He's calling your name in prayer before God right now. Jesus, praying for you, praying for what you're going through, praying for your situation, praying that things will work out. That's good to know. <clears throat> in Ephesians 6, starting in verse 21, but that you also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful administer in the Lord, shall make known to you all things, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that you might know our affairs and that he might comfort your hearts. Peace be to the brethren and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be with them all that love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity. Amen. What's the most valuable thing you've ever transported? Uh, you know, you probably don't work for uh, Loomis or uh, Wells Fargo or any of these armored car companies transporting millions of dollars of cash or millions of dollars worth of gold or any rare artifacts or jewelry or anything like that. I, honestly, I think the most valuable thing I've ever transported was my family. Um, we usually associate value with some kind of expensive physical possession, right? Gold, diamonds, artifacts, rare artifacts, something more precious than gold. Here was Tychicus bringing something very valuable from a Roman prison to a church in Ephesus. He brought with him God's word. It was, under, it was written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit by the Apostle Paul while he was in prison. Here's one of these behind-the-scene guys that worked with Paul. Uh, Acts 20 verse 4 tells us his home was originally in Asia Minor. And he's mentioned you know, four or five times in the New Testament. In most of those passages, he's typically being sent somewhere by the Apostle Paul. I mean, think about it. Uh, running errands or messages might not seem like such a, a, a great task or a glorious job, but his service for the Lord was important. He delivered Paul's letters to the Ephesian and Colossian churches, along with encouragement and information about the Apostle Paul's circumstances. You can read about that in Colossians 4, starting in verse 7. These letters have been instructing and, and encouraging and even challenging to Christians throughout the world ever since that time. And this job that Tychicus had to deliver Scripture is a task that's still given to you and I today. We're to deliver the Scripture also. 
God has given us his word for our benefit, so we can also share it with others. It's the only source of absolute and complete truth because it came directly from God through men who were inspired by the Holy Spirit. All scripture is given by God. Some verses say God breathed, some versions say God breathed, some say God inspired, but it's all given of God. The Bible is one of our most precious possessions. I keep one or two of them in my truck at all times. I'm surrounded by some 300 of them here in my office. We should treat it with care and share it with our fellow believers, as well as those who need to know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So the next time you open the Bible, ask God to make you like Tychicus, this faithful messenger of his word, and see how God might use you. We have to have a supernatural faith in John 20, right there in verse 25, the other disciples therefore said unto him, we've seen the Lord. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe that doubting Thomas. After eight days again, the disciples were within and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut and stood in the midst and said, peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold thy hands, my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Notice here that Jesus didn't rebuke him. Jesus didn't say, Oh, you know, don't, don't call me God, because, you know, he didn't rebuke him. Thomas called him my Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are they which have not seen and yet believed. Thomas refused to believe what he couldn't touch or see or feel. Our five senses were given to us by God, but they're necessary to help us function in this life. It's nice to have them all functioning at the same time. There's a lot of people who have lost one or more of their five essential senses. But if we don't renew our minds like the Bible tells us to acknowledge the limits of our five senses, then they might keep us from believing. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not there. Faith can perceive things that the five senses cannot. Hebrews 11 verse 1. There is a, a human kind of faith, and then there's a supernatural God kind of faith. Human faith is based on physical things we can see, taste, hear, smell, or feel. You know, most people have faith when they sit in a chair, that chair's going to hold them up. Or they have faith when they get on a plane, that that plane's going to get them where they're going. But God's kind of faith believes independently of our physical circumstances. You know, to receive God's gift of salvation, we have to use that supernatural God kind of faith that's not limited by our five senses. You see, that's because in order to be saved, we have to believe for things that we can't see or feel or touch or hear or smell. We haven't seen God in the flesh or even in a vision. We haven't even seen the devil. We haven't seen heaven or hell. or. But we believe these things exist. You know, human faith has a hard time believing what it can't see. Man is so destitute that he can't even believe the gospel on his own. I mean, to receive God's gift of salvation, we have to receive the supernatural God kind of faith first. Where does this faith come from and how are we going to receive it? Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. God's word gives us faith. It contains his faith. As we hear the word of God about salvation, then we receive God's faith so that we can believe the good news of our salvation. We actually use God's faith to get saved, to come to the truth of Christ. This God kind of faith doesn't leave us after we're born again. God's faith becomes a fruit of the spirit that's within us. We don't lose this kind of faith. 
We just have to renew our minds to God's faith, which is in us, and then learn how to use it, how to apply it, how to share it, how to strengthen it, and watch it grow, how to lean upon your faith in God, your faith in Scripture, your faith in Jesus Christ, your faith that he will never leave you nor forsake you, your faith that he loves you, and that he's always with you, even to the end of the world, Jesus said in Matthew 28. Even to the end of the world. That might be sooner than most people think. We have to keep our faith focused on Jesus Christ and not on the lies of man or on the things going on in the world. We have to keep our faith in Christ. He's the only one that can save you. He's the only one that loves you so much that he gives you everlasting life. Trust him today. I love you guys. God bless you. Good Lord willing. I'll see you again tomorrow.